They Came Before Columbus The African Presence in Ancient America by Ivan Van Sertema Chapter 6 Mandingo Traders in Medieval Mexico We observe the fusion of two forces, tradition and newness, to produce the Aztec Empire. This fusion was accelerated by the arrival of a series of cultured immigrants who brought with them ancient knowledge. The most interesting are those whom the Chronicles name those who returned. Ignacio Bernal, Mexico before Cortes. From across the water in nearby Tenochtitlan, he could hear the hollow scream of the conches and the roll of the temple drums fainter than those sounded from the sanctuaries of his own quarter they lingered longer nevertheless echoing in the valley of mexico and in the silent market place of tlatelolco as voices in the secret valleys of the car echo with the whisper of morning dreams he shook himself and rose from the sleeping mat a soft silver dust and mist had settled on the water but the sun sliced it with sharp, swift strokes, sweeping clean the floor of the lake until he could see the silhouette of canoes. Paddles were already slapping the water, fishermen returning from the morning catch, traders unloading their merchandise onto the island's little quays. He had lived for more than a cycle in Tlatelolco as a young man he had spent long hours emblazoning boards for Aztec nobles by affixing the native duck, chicken, and heron feathers with his Ixtli knives. Now he was an officer of the guild, inspecting the quality of featherwork offered to the public by his caste. Many years had passed since the days of Quaquap Pichuac, in whose reign Pochteca from the hot lands had come, some of whom had skins as black as the sheen of ocelots. Their arrival had changed his life. They had come bearing the feathers of the Quetzali bird. None of the work he had done before their coming could compare with the coats of arms he later wrought with the green, blue, and red plumes of that magnificent southern bird. They had come also with the hides of a strange animal not seen before in Mexico. Even in the stalls of the hunting tribe, the Otomi. These black merchants from the hot lands sold vivid colored mantles of cotton cloth, the cloaks so richly dyed they seemed to copy the iridescent plumage of the birds so various in design that the radial wheel of the sun, feathers and stylized shells, the skins of tigers, the forms of rabbits, snakes, fishes, and butterflies mingled in the myriad of motifs with triangles, polygons, crosses, squares, and crescents. Together with these garments they brought into the marketplace golden ear pendants, smoking pipes, some with the heads of the traders carved on the bowls, exotic stones, and shells. They came at first in twos and then in a small band. Their coming attracted attention, but this was less because of the extraordinariness of their presence – foreigners, after all, were expected to look different – than the extraordinariness of their wearers. Some of the luxuries they offered in the common marketplace had been enjoyed almost exclusively by the noblemen and kings of Mexico, who seemed to have had some earlier contract with them. In the reign of Quaquap Pitzwack, they had suddenly appeared, the spearhead of a larger migrating group. Out of what world they had originally come, no one knew, but they trickled in from the direction of the south and the southeast. It seemed as if everyone were on the move at that time. All sorts of people were gravitating toward the lakes 
to form the nucleus of a new Mexico. Because they were of no known race or tribe, their origins obscure, their habits nomadic, they were confused at first with some dark, wandering branch of the Chichimex. But Chichimex was often just a vague, broad term for vagrant peoples, especially peoples whose language appeared to be mixed. These strangers had, in their passage to Mexico from some settlement in the south, picked up Nahuatl, the lingua franca of the Aztecs. But they spoke it as a second tongue, for several of their words were clearly not of that language. Chichimex, however, they certainly were not. He had known some of these nomads from the desert plateau. He thought of their condition as barbaric and wretched. They wore loincloths of palm fiber in that time. Their women stood in awe of the simple loom. They had never fired a single pot. Unable to scrape a living from the land, they gathered mesquite seeds and hunted rabbits. These foreigners, on the other hand, wore feathered headdresses, polished and brilliant earrings, cloaks and loincloths of the finest woven cotton. Small white shells on their ankles rattled softly as they walked. The Chichimex had never built temples or idols, had no high priest. They lived in caves and domed brush shelters. They always ended up as misfits when they lingered in the town. But he had watched these black trader men from the tropical south. They had entered the valley of Mexico armed and apprehensive, but with an air of authority. It was hard to tell what they thought and did in private as he peered at the walls of their houses. Windowless, these houses cloaked in a mystery, like the gardens of an inner court, the lives within. But the blacks had built a temple in the town as soon as they formed a sizable capuli. In the forefront of this temple, they set up the wooden statue of a werewolf, who was their Nagual. This statue fascinated him. They called the god to whom it was built, Coyotli Nual. It was fashioned in the form of both a coyote, the American werewolf, and a man. It was dressed in a coyote skin, but it stood slightly bent like an old man its coyote head covered by a human mask. Its teeth were long and pointed, sheathed in gold. In one hand it carried a stick, which was adorned with black stones, so it looked like a heavily knobbed club. On this the god leaned. Its feet were dressed like those of the traders, with small white rattles on the ankles and saddles, sandals of Yakoto leaves on its paws. He was not the only one of the feather workers who was fascinated by these strangers. The attraction of men from the hot lands who provided them with exquisite new material for their trade was overwhelming. It was not long before they were drawn onto their Nagual and began to join in their rituals and festivities. Even though he himself had never worshipped Coyote Nawal, these were the men with whom he eventually did most of his business and they had become his good friends. He had been allowed to stand on the edge of the palisade as the masked men chanted and danced on the day of the festival. Only yesterday it was, and he had gone to sleep on his mat with the image of braziers piled with resinous pine wood burning away the night. A few native women, their voices, faces luminous and unmasked, had danced with the men. They were daughters of the feather workers who had been taken to wife by the blacks. Thus had the gods and rituals of the native and the foreign, of the Pochteca and Amenteca, slowly fused. Through it all, the comings and goings, the meeting and the mixing, the wedding of gods and of women, he had been there. The years of the strangers had flowed over him like all the strange rivers flowing in that long cartoon of years into the valley of Mexico. He felt the change like water running over a subterranean floor as he looked deeper into the past and the morning. The sun was sitting on the edge of the lake now, and the sky and the stream had merged, 
mirroring each other. Beyond, in the distance, he could see the tops of the volcano smoking. But he could no longer tell whether the thin, drifting dust he saw over the volcano, Popocatepetl, was truly native volcanic smoke, or the far-flung flowers and branches of a foreign cloud. Of all the strange rivers flowing in that age of change and flux into the valley of Mexico, that of the Mandingo was the strangest. Into the bloodstream of how many American tribes this alien stream was soon to flow, it is hard to tell. But in Central America, at least, it entered that of the Otomi and the Lacandon. In the southern lands, the hot lands from which it had traveled to the Central Valley, it had flowed into the Aravos tribe of the Orinoco, where that river flows through what is now Venezuela, the Argualos of Cretara, and the Porages and Matias of Brazil. Balboa had seen some of its surviving elements in Darien, now Panama, through the Chuanas of the Panamanian Isthmus, it had moved in its steady northward sweep. It is with Mexico, however, that we are most concerned. For here we can see the confluence of cultures, not just the confluence of bloods. When we compare the cult of the werewolf, the coyote of the prairies, found among the Amenteca with the cult of the werewolf, the hyena of the savannas, found among the Bambara of medieval Mali, we see quite clearly that we are at the very head of that confluence. The werewolf cult among the Bambara, the leading tribe of the Mandingo, was known as the Nama, and the priest or headman of the cult as the Nama Tigi, heads of the Nama, or the Amantigi, heads of the faith. It is a simple jump from Namatigi or Amantigi to Amanteca, for both Tigi and Teca mean master, chief, or head man. The morphemes Tec, Teki, in fact, produce roughly the same as the Mandingo Tig, Tigi. Carry the same and related meanings through nouns adjectives and verbs in a number of Mexican languages and in Nahuatl. This is but one of many coincidences. In the Mexican ritual, the god of the Amenteca is clothed in the werewolf's skin, although it wears a human mask on its head. This is identical with the Bambara ritual. In the Mexican ritual, the god wields a stick knobbed with black stones. This imitates the stick wielded by the werewolf god of the Bambara, for that too is knobbed, though with fragments of sheep's horns. The Bambara ritual involves the feathered carcass of two great birds. In Mexico, a pot is carried on the back of the god with numerous feathers of a bird, introduced from the tropical south by the Pochteca, namely the Quetzali bird. In Mexico, the god wore an anklet of small white rattles. Rattles are used in the Bambara ritual, not just the ankle rattle of the cult dancers, but the gourd rattle, favorite paraphernalia of the African magician. In fact, in both Mexico and Mali, the gourd rattle becomes a sort of ventriloquist dummy for the voice of the god. This gourd rattle is the chief instrument of both the West African and American fetish men. In it resides the speaking divinity or devil. The rattle has the same name in America as in Mali. The Arabic Mitraqua passing through the western Sudan in Bambara as Mantaraka appears in the American language Guarani as M. Baraka. Also in the American languages, Arawak and Tupi as Maraka. The association with magical ritual 
is also the same. Tupi has not only the word maraca, gourd rattle, but maraca in bara, wizard, witch. The refrain of the Carib diviners using the gourd rattle in other ceremonies in the pre-Columbian Caribbean was also the same. The imprecation of the Caribs consists in a series of songs and chants of which the refrain is Are. Similarly, the Mandingo Negroes call their talking devil Hore. But now to return to the werewolf cults. The Mexican werewolf god is described by the historian Bernardino de Sahagún as having five male idols and two female ones, seven in all. In Mali, these accompanying idols were symbolic of the seven-day week introduced by the Arabs. But the Mandingo modified this introduction by inserting two rest days, Monday and Thursday, to bring it back to their five-day week. These two days are dramatized in the Mexican ritual by the females who, unlike the males, are not dressed like the werewolf. Again, the festival of the werewolf god was celebrated in both cultures twice a year. In Mali, the god is smeared in blood, usually chicken blood. In Mexico, where human sacrifice was habitual and only slightly mediated by the humanity of Quetzalcoatl, blood is provided in the first of the two festivals by humans. The correspondence, however, between Mandingo Nama and Mexican Coyote worship does not end there. A look at Nual from the word Coyote Nual, the werewolf god in America, leads us into other areas of correspondence. D.G. Brenton, in his book, Nogualism, discusses the nature and meaning of Nual and the many derivatives of the verbal root Na, indicating that these words and the body of beliefs attached to them, Nogualism, were brought into Mexico by foreign medicine men. Nawal means knowledge, wrote Brenton, especially mystical knowledge the knowledge of the hidden and secret things of nature. It is significant that neither the radical Na nor any of its derivatives are found in the Huasteca dialect of the Mayan tongue, which was spoken about Tampico, far removed from other members of that stock. The inference is that in the southern dialects it was a borrowed stem. Nor in the Nahuatl language, although its very name is derived from it. Does the radical Na appear in its simplicity and true significance? To the Nawas also it must have been a loan. It is true that De La Serna derives the Mexican Nuali, a sorcerer, from the verb Nuatlia, to mask or disguise oneself, because a Nuali is one who masks or disguises himself under the form of some lower animal, which is his Nagual. But it is altogether likely that the Nualita derived its meaning from the custom of the medicine men to wear masks during their ceremonies. Therefore, if the term Nagual and many of its associates and derivatives were at first borrowed from the Zapotec language, a necessary conclusion is that along with these terms came most of the superstitions, rites, and beliefs to which they allude, which thus became grafted on the general tendency to such superstitions existing everywhere and at all times in the human mind. Along with the names of the days and the hieroglyphs which marked them were carried most of the doctrines of the Nogualists and the name by which in time they became known from central Mexico quite to Nicaragua and beyond. The mysterious words have now indeed lost much of their ancient significance. Among the Lacandons of Mayan stock, who inhabit the forests of the upper waters of the Usu Masintita River. At the present day, the term Naguet or Nagutlat is said to be applied to anyone 
who is entitled to respect and obedience by age and merit. But in all possibility, he is believed to possess superior and occult knowledge. It should be mentioned in this connection that serological surveys of the Lacandon Indians, the most secluded of Maya tribes, conducted in the 1960s by Dr. Alfonso de Garay, director of the genetic program of the National Commission for Nuclear Energy in Mexico, indicated early and extensive contact between the Lacandons and Africans. Negroid characteristics have been found in their blood, although they have not been known to mix with outsiders in post-Columbian times. Dr. de Garay's report includes, among other things, a reference to the sickle cell, a malaria-resistant mutant gene usually found only in the blood of black people. Brenton, in his study of Nagualism, has provided us with a series of Na words in Maya and Maya dialects, like the Quiche dialect of the Yucatan, the Zapotec language, and the Nahuatl language, to show that some foreign group passing through these linguistically diverse but geographically close peoples introduced this series of words. Looking at the series, we see that Na is at the root of words in these languages meaning mystical knowledge, intelligence, prophecy, sorcery, and magic. One example from each language group should be enough to illustrate this point. Na'at, intelligence in Maya. Na'u'al, to prophesy in Quiche. Na a, medicine man and Zapotec, and Na Oali, magician in Nahuatl. The same root Na is at the base of a series of words with the same meaning in the Mandi languages. One part of the series springs from the Arabic Na ba to prophecy. Na be prophet Na ba intelligent and appears in the West African Peol and Dayula languages as Na Bayu in Soso as An Na Bi and in Wolof as Na Bi Na Ideas behind these Arabic Naba Nabi words, however, have fused and become confused with ideas of the native Nama cult, so that we get Naba in the Hobbes Gara language for masked men, who are known as the Nama in Malinke. In Malinke, also we get Nama Koro, which literally means hyena wise men which is an exact translation of the Nuatal Coyotli Nual, meaning Coyote Wiseman, with a coyote in America, werewolf of the prairies, is substituted for the African hyena, werewolf of the savannas. There is one aspect of the African Nama ritual that was not carried forward in the main coyote ritual but nonetheless preserved in another ritual associated with a black god the Mexicans call Ekchua. Attributes of a beekeeper god found in the Mandingo Nama worship seem to have fused with attributes of the Mandingo traders themselves to produce the complex figure of this strange god among the Mexicans. Ek Chua was a god of traders or traveling merchants and was often confused with the coyote god whom the Amenteca worshipped. He is black in all his representations and is also pictured as warlike, armed with a lance and sometimes engaged in combat. 
This is to be expected because the Mandingo trader had to be warlike and always on his guard against hostile, suspicious tribes as he explored new trade routes. In fact, it is as a captive of native tribes with whom he had waged wars of self-defense that the pre-Columbian African was first seen by the Spanish in the New World in the Isthmus of Darien, now Panama, and on an island off Cartagena, Colombia. A particularly African feature of this trader god, Ectua, was the bale of merchandise he carried on his head. Professor Gonzalo Aguirre Beltran has pointed out in his Ethno History of the Negro in Mexico that his habit of carrying heavy things on the head and young children astride the hip is an indisputable African influence upon the Mexican. Ectua is also often distinguished by his age. He is usually featured in the Mexican codices as an old man with a toothless jaw or one solitary tooth and a drooping lower lip. He is also related to bee culture. This is demonstrated by his presence in the Codex Choano in the section on bees. All these aspects of Ectua link him unequivocally with the old beekeeping god found in Nama worship among the Bandingo. In Nama worship, the god represented as an old man was sometimes put in a beehive used as a tabernacle while his devotees drank a honey drink and danced and howled around him. The medieval Mexican celebrated the festival of Ectua on the same day as the holiday of Habnil, the god of the beekeepers, and during this feast they drank three bowls of honeyed wine. A Mandingo element from Nama worship also accounted for the extraordinary nose of this black god among the Mexicans. The long nose of Ectua is due to the fact that the idol of the Nana, called Kungolo Nama, head of the Nama, is represented by a fantastic bird that is, with a beak. That beak is carried forward in the long nose. The Ectua thus becomes among the Mexicans the Lord of the Nose. The relationship may now be seen very clearly between the Amenteca of Mexico and the Amentigi or Namatigi of Mali. The worship of the werewolf totem or Nagual underwent very few changes indeed in its transplantation from Mali to Mexico. As in all transplantations, local fauna and material simply replaced the original. The hyena became the coyote, the stick knobbed with sheep's horns became the stick knobbed with black stones. The bright tropical birds of Africa had their feathers matched by the rich plumes of the South American Quetzali bird. But the basic complex of ideas and their unique origination remained behind as skeletal evidence of their African origin. Vague general parallels and ritual behavior may evolve independently in remote cultures, but there is a complex cluster of elements here. Not only symbols, images and ritual acts but even linguistic labels and conceptual confusions that could not have been repeated in their arbitrariness by virtue of a similar response to the same phenomena. The identicals are so staggering that one feels one is looking into a mirror at what both the Mexican and Mali magicians would call the shadow of the twin, the spirit of the double. As for the merchant caste known as the Pozteca, let us examine some of the items they brought into Mexico. While these, or most of them, were obviously made by them in their new settlements along the Atlantic seaboard and in South America, they were copied from Mandingo prototypes. 
The names carried forward in these items demonstrate this. From Sahagun's account of the first foreign merchants, we learn that they sold mantles, jamali, and waistcloth, maxtli. In the language of Maya, jamali is translated as shield buckler. Valpachimali, a derivative of the word, is translated as battle cloak. A study of the word in the Mexican languages establishes a relationship between buckler and cloak. In Maya, more than one idea is rooted in the word. In addition to shield and cloak, there is chim and chamil, meaning pouch. These oddly linked ideas of pouch and cloak are also contained in terms found in the Mandi languages. They have an Arabic origin and came into the Mandi language through the Arab caravan trade. An Arabic term is simla, plural simal, produced, pronounced timal, meaning a garment in which one wraps oneself, as well as a bag or pouch put to the racine of a palm tree in order that the fruit may not be shaken off, or held under the udder of the ewe or goat when the udder is heavy with milk. Equally interesting is Maxtli, which in the American language of Nahuatl means a waist cloth to hide the nudity. This garment is tied around the private parts of women as an intimate adornment. It is shown to correspond with the Malinke word Masiti, adornment, Bambara, Masiri, adornment to make one's toilet, and Bambara, Masirili, ornamentation, toilet. There is also the female loincloth, which in Mexico is Nagua. This barely covered a woman's privates, falling from the waist to the middle of the thigh. It may be traced back to the Nagba in Mandi, from Lagba in Malinke, and Dayula, intimate female cover cloth, to Legame in Arabic which is a menstrual cloth. The very composition of the word for traitor, Pochteca, provides us with an interesting clue as to its origin. Pochteca is a compound of poch and teca. Teca may be traced to the Mandi word tigi, as I have already shown. The poach in Pochteca is traceable to the pole in Maya, Polom, merchant. This finds its counterpart in the language of the Soninke, another people in the medieval Mandingo world. Soninke gives us Folom, rich man, merchant. Fray Toribio de Motolina in his memoirs refers to the Mexican marketplace as Tian Quizco, which may have been derived from Tan Gazmayo, a word for a trader in West Africa. Even today, in Central America, Tian Quiz and Tianque are used colloquially for marketplace. Since many of the trader words and trading items we have been discussing here have Arabic roots, it would appear that Arabic cultural influence on the medieval Mandingo was pervasive and overwhelming. This is not the case. The Islamic influence on medieval Mali hardly touched the common people. Even the kings from Sundiata down to the king of the Atlantic expeditions Abu Bakri II gave Islam little more than lip service. 
There were of course exceptions. Kan Kan Musa, Abu Bakari's half brother, took a vast horde of sixty thousand Mandingo across the deserts to Mecca, the Islamic heartland in thirteen twenty four. But Mali's administrative and political structure owed nothing to the Arabs. It was not a theocracy but grew out of a federation of native families. Mandingo, animist ritual, and magical religious beliefs were not Arab-Islamic, although the Mandingo later took scraps of the Quran and transformed them to suit their purposes. Their magicians chanted the fifth chapter of the Quran, the Fatiha, as it were another of their magical incantations. Arab-Islamic influence on medieval Mali, therefore, was very peripheral but its impact on trade and on traders cannot be denied. Nearly all traveling traders in West Africa became Muslims. It was the pragmatic thing to do, since nearly all foreign trade was with the Arabs, hence the many Arabic words to be found in Mandingo trading items. Another Arabic influence may be found in the coats of arms of medieval Sudan. Most notable of these is the crescent on some Sudanic medieval armor. It is generally represented by one upward sign, but frequently it has three stars connected with it, or the crescent is repeated two or three times. This is a characteristic Muslim emblem. It is also found in medieval Mexico. The crescent accompanied at the bottom by three stars or crescents is found on many Mexican shields. The Norwegian historian Sven Magnus Grodis has pointed out that when warlords moved on to conquer and settle in new lands, they carried their coats of arms with them. He maintains that some of the American glyphs were carried by old world warriors as the heraldic emblems of their noble families. It has been shown that one of the main mandingos in ten or insignia of distinction or nobility the Triple Crescent was the same as the Mexican, except that within these crescents, the Mandingo sometimes inserted pictures of animals, their totems, and the walls. Since the Mexican feather workers designed coats of arms and were heavily influenced, as if we have seen, by the Mandingo merchants, it is only to be expected that some of these designs would be carried over. Even the word for noble or man of distinction is preserved in the identical Carib word, Nateno. Extraordinary animal skins also entered Mexico from the south, skins of animals unknown in the Americas. In a letter to the Spanish sovereigns written in 1505, known as the Lettera Rarissima, Columbus mentions the presence of the lion in America. No such animal prowled the prairies or forests of either north or south in the age of Columbus, though there is evidence for a prehistoric American lion. It has therefore been suggested that he made a mistake, though Columbus probably became acquainted with the appearance of the lion during his visit to West Africa in 1483. In any case, he could not have seen it as a living beast in free motion or in captivity in the New World, but may have been led to this remark by the sight of its skin somewhere on display. Bernal Diaz, who was taken along with Cortez by the Mexican king Montezuma to see the marketplace of Tlateluco in the first quarter of the 16th century, mentioned in his detailed list of merchandise the skins of lions. It is hard to believe that a man with the meticulous care and precision of Diaz was led into the same mistake. The lion's visage, its mane, its proportions are very distinctive. Diaz could not have confused it with the tiger, its close cousin, for he also makes mention of tigers. Lions would have been unusual even in medieval Mali, a savannah empire known as the bright country because it had no jungle. There were lions, however, to the south of the bright lands, and rare as they were, 
they were captured in hunting raids. Medieval African kings and powerful men took pride in lion skins. Suman Guru, the sorcerer, king of the Sasso, whose defeat by Sundiata led to the foundation of the Mali Empire in 1234, lined a room of his nine-story castle with the skins of many animals, including the lion. It is conceivable that since the lion was not native to the Americans in historic times, and lion skins were seen in the Colombian contact period, these may have been the well-cured skins of animals Africans had hunted down in their original homelands and transported either in the Mandingo, 1310-1311, or Songhay, circa 1462-1492, contact period. These skins could be preserved for generations. Lion skins of great ritual value in Africa have been passed down the line of African chiefs and kings. We have been concentrating in this chapter on the evidence of Mandingo traders in Mexico, but it would be wrong to suppose that the Mandingo settled only there, and that it is only in Mexico that their influence may be demonstrated. It seems that the landfalls of the 1310 and 1311 expeditions were in the Isthmus of Darien, now Panama, and the northeastern corner of South America. A vanguard of the partly party certainly entered Mexico, but settlement in Mexico extended slowly over the ensuing decade. Reports of foreign groups trickling into Mexico occur all through the first quarter of the 14th century, which quarter ended 1325, with the legend of a battle between an eagle and a serpent, and the choice of the site of the battle as a place to build Mexico Tenochtitlan. Among these foreign migratory groups is one which is reported to have brought agriculture and pottery to a hunter and gatherer tribes of the Chichimex and to have helped in the design and erection of the first windowless houses on Lake Texcoco around 1327. Texcoco was the starting place for the inland journey to the hotlands. These immigrants were known as those who returned and were credited with fine gold and silver work and with ancient knowledge. They may have replaced a company of blacks who settled 14 or 15 years earlier. 1310 and 1311 question mark, in Mexico and then abruptly left in a vain attempt to return to their native home. The Mandingo blacks practiced settled agriculture and they must therefore have fixed settlements in South and Central America but their traders by the very nature of the occupation were nomadic, ever on the move, passing through unfamiliar and sometimes hostile territory. They built temporary bases for their defense. Some of these bases built on elevated mounds strongly resemble West African stockades. A comparison of the pale African stockade from F. Moore's Travels into the Inland Parts of Africa with Lemoyne's drawing of a Florida stockade made in the mid 16th century, reproduced in Debris de Commodus et Insularum Ritibus, Virginia, is most striking. Both are circular, built on heavy upright posts, have an identical gate entrance, and contain rows of circular huts and within both the stockades are two fields. It is important to point out in this connection that the Pales were part of the complex of peoples within the medieval Mandingo Empire and that the, their presence in pre-Columbian America has been further established by Jules Canvet's discovery of an amazing number of animal names shared between them and the Guarani an American tribe. There were several bases from which the African traders spread into the Americas. From the Caribbean and the Songhay period 
circa 1462 to 1492, from northeastern South America in the Mandingo period, 1310 onward, into Peru, and from a base in Darien, moving along roads marked by the presence of burial mounds into and beyond Mexico as far north as Canada. These burial mounds provide further witnesses to their presence and the lines of their dispersal. Within them, among the usual native items are to be found pipes with West African heads and totems. Other Negroid figurines and godwalls and blue and white shells. These shells have been found in such quantity and so selectively stored, akin in typology to a coin collection, as to suggest very strongly that they were used as money, a practice familiar to West Africans, but alien to the pre-Columbian American, for whom shells had simply a ritual and ornamental, not a monetary value. End of chapter 6